Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is, um, it's truly, um, I was telling you first service, and the first service, I mean, that's an 8.30 service. So let me tell you something. Those 830 people, all right, they're the real Christians, just so y'all, y'all know. If you want one up anybody, you come to the 830 service. But uh, <laughs> that's right. It is uh, really an honor to be with you. And uh, let me just say from the onset, I love your pastor. I love your pastor. He is... Um, He is real deal Holyfield. Let me tell you why. Because it was Matt that, uh, upon assuming the pastorate here, he sought me out. And uh, Matt came to Lighthouse and spent uh, a morning with me. We had a cup of coffee. He just shared his heart. And, um, I mean, right from the jump, I fell in love with Matt. And I fell in love with Matt, by and large, due to his heart and his expression and what he wants in, in the church. And let me tell you one of the reasons that I love Matt. Because as a pastor, you need to know this about your pastor. He wants more for you than he wants from you. That's not always the case. So, so don't take that for granted. He truly wants more for you than he wants from you. And that was apparent to me um, in our first conversation. And so this was Matt's heartbeat. If you don't know it, Matt was sort of the brainchild behind this Better Together series. And, um, and he's the one that, you know, really initiated the collaboration of the churches in the area. Sort of put me to shame, all right? If I have one attitude towards Matt, it's because he thought of it and I didn't, all right? <laughs> and so it makes me feel a little guilty. Nevertheless, he's the one that came up with it. And, um, and it, it did not surprise me, and here's why. Because those of you that call ACC home, this is the legacy of your house. Your house has always had the heartbeat of being a church that's known we're better together. There's been no competitiveness or there's been no sort of, you know, um, individuality. And the reason that I know that is because eight years ago when Lighthouse Church moved from Pasadena to Glen Burnie, and uh, we really felt God called us back here. And, and uh, I'm born and raised in Glen Burnie, but how many of you know if God calls you out of one place to Glen Burnie, you want to make sure that's Jesus? <laughs> okay. I was waiting on the Miami, okay? Amen, Lord, we hear you. Nope, it was Glenn Burney. And so uh, Brian was uh, the single, you know, point of contact that really loved me and invested in me and resourced me. Why? Because he knew we're better together. And so that's your legacy. And so it's an honor to be part of it, stand on this stage, and, uh, and really serve your house in that capacity. Amen. And so um, I bring with me good tidings from Lighthouse Church. We love you. We've watched what's happened here. We're seeing your growth and we're seeing what Jesus is doing here. And I know that growth is uncomfortable. We get it all the time at Lighthouse. We're like, I don't like so many people that are coming here. And I often say, well, then you're going to hate heaven, okay? I mean, I, you know, just, just deal with it. This is what Jesus does. And so I love to see a church that's growing. It's a testament that Jesus is building his church. So I'm here with my, my lovely Ruth in the house is my wife and my son is the best dressed in the room. I know that was really stupid of me to say. I know. I, but uh, Lucia is here. Where's Lucia? Lucia, a little hand up. She's, uh, she's the prettiest girl in the room. And then my um, other wrecking machine, he's up in the kid zone, probably breaking drywall. Okay. <laughs> so um, um, I'm going to begin by reading a text out of Ephesians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go there with me. Matt tasked me um, with preaching on... Uh, the Bride of Christ. Obviously, over the course of this series, we're working through various metaphors used in Scripture as it pertains to how the church is viewed. Paul, the apostle, will call us the Bride of Christ. Peter, the apostle, will call us the building blocks of Christ, the living stones. Paul also will call us the body of Christ. But for all intents and purposes, as it pertains to the Bride of Christ, I want to read this text out of Ephesians 5. Some oftentimes use this text by means and ways to talk about marriage. We're not going to do that this morning, so all the men in the house can rest easy. Don't you worry. But um, this is what it says. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Ladies, can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Many of you would like, why can't we just preach that right there? Not that Sunday. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain and or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, Paul concludes by saying, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Let me just say that what Paul is, is doing here is, is sort of crystallizing, if you will, the identity of who God's people are in light of who God himself is. That Paul wants us to understand how it is that God sees us and how we should see him as his church. And the reason that this is important to you and to I, because as I say often, when you know who you are, then you'll know what to do. It's only when your identity is straight and secure and you know who you are that you'll then know what to do. If your identity is jacked up and you're not so clear on who you are, you certainly won't be clear on then what your responsibility is or your purpose is or what to do. You can see this the world over. We live in the midst of a culture right now. It's in the midst of an identity crisis. That's why everybody's grappling and pandering and placating and trying to get to other people so as they can help them maybe define them or give them a sense of security and belonging and identity when, in fact, we need not look any further than Jesus himself. But I know that it takes nothing shy of the Holy Spirit to show us that, so I'd love to begin by prayer and we'll get right to it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you, Father, that you see fit to call us your bride. We gathered here this morning, Father, not to read words on a page, but to experience the resurrected King of heaven, Jesus himself. Would you come, Father, by your Holy Spirit, show us what we need to see for your glory and for our joy. I pray this in Jesus' awesome name. And all God's people said, I, um, I, I grew up in the church. So as the old adage is, I, I cut my teeth on pews. I was in the church all the time. I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid, and um, I fulfilled the full gamut of that title. I, I was the, the good young man, and then I was the very, very bad young man. I was the pastor's kid that spent a ton of time in the church. I remember that we had midweek meetings, we had fellowship meetings, we had joint meetings, we had special meetings, we had worship meetings, we would have elders meetings that I was required to go to and hang out in the sanctuary. We would have weekend meetings and we would have meetings in between. I could count and tell you on any given Sunday how many pieces of gum were under all the chairs in the <laughs> sanctuary. I would crawl under all of them. I, I was there often. Um, our church at the time, when I was part of it, it was, um, it was certainly uh, a charismatic church. Um, we were sort of, you know, experiencing the wave of the charismatic movement. This is right after the Jesus movement. So this is, you know, late 80s and early 90s. And so we, we were rather charismatic. And therefore, I saw things that I, I wish I'd like to unsee, be totally frank <laughs> with you. Um, I, I was, uh, you know, privy to where, uh, you know, um, times that, you know, we would have in our church what they called the train. And the train is when, you know, worship really got going. When you were really spiritual, you just start running around in the sanctuary. Grown adults, may I add. And I would stand up against the wall, freaking out, hoping that someone would not grab my hand trying to pull me into the train. You know what I'm talking about. I, 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 I um, would have friends that would spend um, the night at our house at the time, uh, Saturday night, and I would hate it if they'd spend the night on Saturday night because the rule was if you spent the night on Saturday night, you had to go to church with us on Sunday morning. And then they come to church, and then they'd have questions. 
like, like, like why we did certain things. And I didn't have answers. They'd have questions about like the banners. We got any old school in the house, had banners in your church like that would say Abba. And like one banner would have like a lamb with like blood coming out of its side. We knew what it meant, but they didn't. They were like, why you got animals with blood coming out of the side? And it would make perfect sense to us, but I couldn't articulate. And, and so, so we were charismatic. That's why to this day I call myself a charismatic with a seatbelt. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Uh, because I, I saw a ton, but it would only be as I matured and, and grew and came into my own walk with Jesus and gained a, a theological perspective that was rooted in Scripture about the church that, that I quickly realized this and that this happens often. You can be so involved in the church that you easily forget you are the church. You, you, you can be so, um, 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 you know, constant in your involvement in that you forget your identity of. I think right now I, I'm constantly having to govern the, the fact that you can be so busy doing the work of God that you just forget to stop and be mindful that you are a child of God. And when it comes to the church, I think it's easy for all of us just to, you know, become at times weekend warriors or constant in our attendance or, and, or involvement that we're so in it that we forget we are it. When in fact the church, the church, when we talk about this, this idea and we're going to spend four weeks working through this series called Better Together, you, you must understand that the church, what you are and what I am, we are the very apple of God's eye. We're the very institution that he promised to build and said, I will be relentless until I come to take you with me. He is actually consumed singularly and exclusively with building his church. And the heart is that many, many, many would be part of his family. We capture this actually from Jesus himself where he stood in a township called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus' ministry was growing and it was thriving and he was doing signs and wonders and exploits. And finally he gathered his disciples unto himself and he said, who do people say that I am? What is the word on the street concerning me? And the disciples said to him, oh, well, some say that you're a prophet and some say that you're Elijah reincarnated and some say that you're this. And so there's a lot of chatter on the street, Jesus, concerning you. And he looked at, at Peter and said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, oh, oh, you're the Christ. Now, I just want you to understand that Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ means you're the anointed one. You're the Messiah. You, T. Peter said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. You did not figure that out on your own. But my father who is in heaven and on this rock, this truth, this simple truth that Jesus is God. He said, on this truth, I am going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There will be nothing that will stand against it. And in that word that he used for church there, he used a Greek word called ekklesia. And he said, and on this ekklesia, which means gathering and or assembly of believers, Jesus said, I'm going to build a gathering of Jesus followers and no one or anything, or any nation, or any demon in hell will be able to stop it. And here you sit, 2,000 years later, part of this Jesus gathering that he promised to build in downtown Glen Burnie, nonetheless. That's a miracle altogether <laughs> that you now are part of his architecture and design, and we are his people. That's awesome, is it not? That's absolutely incredible. And so some would argue, okay, well, what, what then is the purpose of the church? Like, like if he wants us to gather, 
and he's creating an assembly, oftentimes we, we don't simply ask, well, what then is the purpose of the church? I believe it boils down to um, a, a fundamental sort of misunderstanding of identity. And so we don't know what to do. The purpose of the church has always been um, relatively simple. I'm not saying it's easy to implement all the time, but it's threefold. Um, if, if you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. I believe that note takers um, get a front line in heaven. I can't find that chapter and verse, but I'm going to find it. Nevertheless, if you're taking notes, I want you to write three purposes of the church. The first is, is that the purpose of the church, first and foremost, is ministry to God. Ministry to God. Meaning that the, the, the priority of the church when we gather is to make sure that our focus and our gaze and our ob object of worship is God himself. Not man-centric, God-centered. It's not about our needs or our wants or our consumeristic asp attitudes. It's about God. So that's why, as Dustin said, when we gather, you can even see this in the construct of a service, the first thing we do is worship. And that's not like a pregame concert. That's not like just to impress you that we're relative and hip and cool. No, that is to let God know you are preeminent and our minds and eyes are fixed on you. This is why David says in Psalm 34, he says, Oh, come let us magnify the Lord. How do any of you know when you magnify something, you focus on it and you blow it up? Oh, come let us magnify the Lord. And he says, and together exalt his holy name. Why? Because Jesus, you are worthy of our worship, despite where we're at, where our circumstances and or situation, you are worthy of it. It's ministry to God. What a privilege that we actually can reciprocate some of the blessings God gives us by our worship back to him. And I know that you know that the, when, 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 as cliche as at times it sounds, when praises and worship goes up, I truly believe blessings do come down. That when you make God your priority, he makes your needs his priority. This is why the first and foremost aspect of the church is that it is ministry to God. Secondly, it's ministry to others. That when we gather together, really, we are to minister one to another. That's why th there is preaching. We, we, we preach because we believe that the proclamation of God's holy and errant authoritative scripture really helps us grow in our walk with him. Um, Paul told Timothy, when you gather, and Timothy was Paul's disciple and student, he says, when you gather, preach the word. Don't preach pithy one-liners and a little chicken soup for the soul or your opinion or what you heard Oprah say. Preach the word. Why? Because Paul go on to say that the word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Divides soul and spirit. Cuts to the very motives and intents of the heart. It shows you and I where to step and where not to, what to do and what not to, how to navigate this thing called life in such a jacked up world. The word is truth and those that adhere to it are liberated by it. Amen. I'm constantly telling the church, we do, not, we do not get the word to conform to us, we conform to the word. This is why David said, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It shows me how to reap what Jesus promised in John 10, 10, life and life to the full. And so, so, so it's ministry to others. This is why the New Testament church in Acts, it says they would meet in the temple courts and then they would meet in homes. They would break bread and give themselves to the apostles' teaching, making all things common, meeting one another's needs as they saw. And it says this, and they rejoiced and stood in all of what God was doing and Jesus added to their number daily, much like he's doing at ACC, amen? Why? Because they ministered to God first and they ministered to one another second. And then lastly, lastly, it's ministry to the world. 
that we gather here on weekends and then we scatter from here after service and we go to our respective homes, we go to our workplaces tomorrow, we go back into our social circles, we go to the restaurants that we love to frequent, we go to wherever we go and we take Jesus with us. Amen? Because we live in a dark, despairing, decaying, dying, jacked up world and we are the light that Jesus wants us to penetrate the darkness. Amen? And so Jesus says in Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill whose light cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket, but puts it on a stand for all the room to be lit by. Therefore, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what we do. That's what we do. We don't wholly huddle and just stay in, in here. We disperse from here because the mission field is out there. I, I, I know that, you know, we are not full of, of just, this isn't in a room of perfect people. Can I get an amen? I should get a louder amen than that. I mean, we are not perfect people. We're broken people that met a perfect Savior. And so we don't gather here because we got it all together. We gather here because we're weak and we need the wholeness that's only found in Jesus. I have friends that I ask all the time, man, you've got to come to church with me. And they'll say to me, no, nah, I, don't, I don't do church. I don't do church. No, I don't do, you know, organized religion. And matter of fact, church is only full of hypocrites. And I'll say, well, hey, we always got a seat for one more. You can come on down. <laughs> always got, because that's what we are. God forbid, I try to act like we're not. You know, we say one thing, we do another. I know that we want to minimize that. Even the Apostle Paul said that he was hypocritical in Romans 7. The very thing he said, I want to do, I don't do. And the thing that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. But we got to go out there in the darkness. I believe whatever we avoid as a church, the enemy will invade. And so there is no area that we're not called to. We take the darkness or, or the light into the darkness. That's the purpose of the church, ministry to God, ministry to others, and ministry to the world. But, 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 Matt didn't ask me to preach on the purpose of the church. Matt asked me, preach on the bride as the church. And see, I, I find it, just incredibly profound that the Apostle Paul would call us the bride of Christ. Because in a Jewish culture and in a context, Paul, the Apostle, understood that Jewish people lived with an Eastern mindset. Therefore, they needed word pictures and metaphors to help them make sense of what the concepts were within Scripture, what the theology was, and the doctrine that Paul was trying to really disciple them in. When it comes to you and I being the bride, that being our identity, there's reasons why. There's biblical reasons why. I believe there's a myriad of reasons why. But I just want to give you three real briefly this morning uh, as it pertains to how God sees you and why it is that we are called the bride of Christ. I want you to understand that you are the nearest and dearest thing to the heart of the Father. That as Jesus being our groom and you being his bride, there is a, an affinity, an affection towards you. That even in a day and age where people are done with the church, Jesus takes that extremely personal. Why? Because you are his crown of glory. You are his people and his anticipated bride that he's coming back for. If you said to me, Sammy, I really, really like you. I like you. I like your personality. I, I, like, I like how you wear short pants and white shoes. I, 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 I like, you know, your, your, your little thing. But hey, I really, I, I, don't, I don't like Ruth. You're cool. Ruth, not so much. So can just you and I hang out? How many of you would know? I'd have a real problem with that. Okay, I'd probably do a little laying on of the hands. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it, it, because Ruth and I, we are a package deal. We are synonymous. Ruth represents me. I represent Ruth. And so we come together. When it comes to Jesus and his church, he means the same thing. Amen? 
And so there's three aspects to you and I being the bride of Christ. The first is, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. There is a passionate pursuit. Passionate pursuit of you. Listen to what um, Paul writes in Ephesians 5. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Hear this, hear this. And gave himself up for her. Husbands, love your wives like Jesus loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he so loved so loved, as John 3.16 is going to tell us, that he gave his one and only son, God, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, that he is constantly, perpetually, and relentlessly pursuing you. He pursued you. Do you know that you would not be sitting here today if it weren't that God were pursuing you? This isn't your idea. This isn't like you, you, you had bad pizza last night and you woke up and you're like, let's go to Glen Burnie and go to church. No. That is the hound of heaven, Charles Spurgeon would call it, that lured you and is pursuing you and who first loved you. Jesus tells us in John 15, do not get it twisted. I chose you. You did not choose me. I chose you because I'm madly in love with you. That Jesus pursues us as his bride and then continually pursues us over time. He's never just like, oh, I got him, so I'm just going to eh, let, it, let it go. Now, 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 let's be honest about marriage. Here's what's really profound about his pursuit of us. See, when we're dating, we date the projected us, but we marry the actual us. You know what I'm talking about? You date the projected other half. You marry the actual other half. I, do a, I, I, I used to do a lot of marriage counseling. I hear a lot of wives be like, this was a bait and switch. I got hoodwinked. There's no way I knew he was like that. I want my money back, my ring back. I want my life back. You know what I'm talking about? This was a setup. Because they didn't know. They didn't know. Of course we put the best foot for, forward. Of course we will. You know, I mean, oh, man, we're showing up with flowers, opening doors. Oh, you know, talking all hours and night. Now he won't even pick up the phone. <laughs> I mean, we know. We, we, we don't know. Can I tell you something? Jesus knew you fully. He didn't get Sammy and was like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> man, I had no idea you were this messed up, Sammy. I mean, nope, I think I got the wrong end of the deal here. I'm sending you back out to pasture. He knew how messed up I was, and yet he still pursued me, and he still pursues me. I, I remember um, when I was in college in upstate New York, um, I had this dilapidated old blazer. It was this, this blazer. It was, uh, the, the, the fact that it would start was, was, was a miracle. Um, it, it wasn't safe to drive from here to Brewster's. I mean, true story. Um, I was seven hours away in upstate New York, right out of Rochester, but Ruth and I, we were engaged at the time. I would get in that blazer every single weekend. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my... Sorry. Let me tell you a little bit about, about, about the blazer. Um, had bald tires on it. Um, had a, a slip in the transmission. Had a gaping hole in the dashboard because my brother ripped the radio out and threw it out the window because he got frustrated. And so it didn't have any heat and it didn't have any AC. So when I would drive out of New York in the dead of winter, I would look like an Eskimo. All you see is eyes, right? I mean, big coat, mittens on, whole nine yards. All I was thinking about, I got to get home to Ruth. All right, she was a peanut butter to my jelly. I got to be there, okay? And we were trying to keep it pure at the time, too. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, so, so, so we'd have to sit on at separate ends of the couch, you know? I mean, I'd drive all the way home just to look at her on the other side of the room because I couldn't, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We were going to do it God's way. Anyway, anyway, I would pursue her. I mean, I would drive seven hours. I would pray all the way home. That truck would not leave me stranded. I'd pray in languages I didn't even know, tongues. I'd get real charismatic. I just need to get home. So often you can imagine Ruth now goes, where's the cat that used to drive the blazer seven hours <laughs> out of New York to pursue me? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm going to find him. Because what happens is we pursue 
temporarily and once we get, our, our, our passion wanes. That never happens with God. That never happens with God. He fully and completely knew you. Ephesians tells us that while we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love. He showed it. He displayed it. He wanted us to see it. While we weren't even in pursuit of him, Jesus died for us so as to show us how much he passionately loved us. Let me tell you something. I stand on this stage because God pursued me. I was a strung out heroin addict, didn't want anything to do with God, had ran as far and as fast from him as I could, found myself on the precipice of death, laying in a downtown Washington, D.C. rehabilitation program. I still didn't want God. All I wanted to do was get clean and not die. And I lay in this bed on a Friday night, and the God of heaven, that even though I was an enemy of him, still pursued me and found me in that bed and spoke to me and spoke to me in a line that I will never forget as long as I live. And he said to me, Sammy, you find out how awesome I am and you'll fear me. And when you fear me, you'll obey me. And when you obey me, you'll fall in love with me. It wrecked my life for the better. Amen. He ravished my soul. Why? Because he is a God that pursues because he wants you and I as his bride. That's why we're here. That's what he calls you and I. But not only does he passionately pursue us, but secondly, secondly, he passionately prepares us. Listen to what Paul told the church at Ephesus. Husbands, love your wives just as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. That's why there's no sanctification outside of God's word. If you want to get disciples, if you want to change, the first thing that's got to change is your intake. This is how we get cleansed. This is how we get regenerated. This is how we get renewed. This is how we get more like Jesus. Through the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church. Jesus wants us, when he comes for us, he wants us ready, radiant, beautiful, clean. Listen to this. Without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. That what God says here is that I am preparing you for what I have prepared for you. So what I got to do is I'm going I'm to renew you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to regenerate you. I'm going to refine you. I'm going to clean you. He who started a good work in you, Scripture says, is faithful to bring it to the place of completion. That means he uses anything and everything to prepare you. So there's nothing that you're going through that he does not leverage and or use by way of your preparation. He uses your circumstances, he uses your hardships, he uses your stresses, he uses your relationships, he uses your church life, he uses your workplace that you think tomorrow morning you're getting ready to go back to hell. No, you're not. You're going back to the preparing ground that God is refining you with. This is why James, the brother of Jesus, will say, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you fall into various trials and tribulations, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And when patience has its full and complete work, you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Why? Because God is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. This is why Paul says in Romans 8, and God uses all things, notice the work there, all, all things to bring about his good work in you for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You're being prepared. And not only are you being prepared, but he also is preparing something for you. I want you to consider what John 14 says. This is the night prior to Jesus being crucified. This is what's called the Last Supper. And this is where Jesus has his disciples around a table and he says to them this. As they're getting ready to freak out, 
at the thought that who they thought was going to overthrow Rome is actually going to be nailed to a tree. And he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe now also in me. For in my Father's house there are many rooms, and if that were not so, he said, I would not have told you. But where I go, listen to this, I prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be with me also. He's talking to his bride. He's talking to his pursued church. He's talking to his beloved, that I'm preparing a place for you, so where I go, you may be with me also. And if I go there, Jesus said, I will return to take you with me. That not only am I preparing you, but I'm preparing something for you. When Ruth and I, we were engaged, um, I would also drive out of New York because I thought it was a great idea for us to have our first home be on a boat, okay? <laughs> let, me, let me just save any innovator in the room that ever thinks that's a good idea. That's a horrible idea, okay? I don't know how I did it, but I sold her on. I bought this old tugboat. I gutted it. I said it's going to be like incredible. It's like a yacht on the water, but it wasn't a yacht. It was like a houseboat that looked like a tugboat, and it was like a trailer on the water. And nevertheless, <laughs> I convinced her to, to, to move on it, and Ruth and I, when we got married, we promised we would never use the D word in our marriage, meaning we will never use divorce as we argued. Six months into living on that boat, she said to me one morning, I will divorce you tomorrow if you don't get me off this boat. <laughs> I was like, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And we got off that boat. <laughs> But I remember, and babe, you remember, I mean, I prepared that boat, I mean, with love. It was with love. I mean, I couldn't wait for her to move on it and to see it. And I wouldn't take her there sometimes because I wanted to dress it up because I was preparing her or, or it for what I had prepared for her. I want you to know Jesus is preparing a place for you. But it ain't no boat. It's a mansion in the heavenly places in the celestial city because he so passionately loves you that not only did he pursue you, but he's prepared something for you while he's preparing you. Listen, lastly, lastly, for the promise that he has for you. And here's the promise that Jesus says that what I have prepared for you, one day I'm gonna come back to take you to be with me also. That this promise is his presentation. That his bride will come spotless and pure and holy and without blemish. That he's preparing you for the great promise that he has for you. Can I just tell you, church, this is not the be all end all. As the bride of Christ, our great hope isn't in, in some financial windfall. It's not that we don't go through no more uh, trials. It's not that um, our circumstances get easy or we upgrade our home or maybe we'll get a new car. Those are so cheap. Our promise and our hope is that we're pilgrims passing through with the king of heaven that says, I'm pursuing you constantly because I love you and I want a relationship with you. I'm preparing you relentlessly for that which is in store for you. And you can hold me to my word that my promises are yes and amen. And you might be wondering, well, what's the promise? What then is the promise that we look forward to as his bride and his promise is given us in Revelations 19, where as his bride, we anticipate the betrothal. We anticipate that incredible day. And this is what John records in Revelations. He says, and then I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and he wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. 
He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, listen to this, and dressed in fine linen, linen, white and clean. You know what they're dressed for? The wedding. The wedding. And Jesus is not coming back as meek and mild Jesus. He's coming back as our knight in shining armor. He is coming back with the king as the king of glory. He is coming back for the black bride that he's pursued and that he's prepared and that he is passionately in love with. It says, and coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword on which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come gather together for the great supper of God. If there's ever a time to clap, it is right now. That is our promise. That is our anticipation that we as the bride of Christ is the one that he's coming back for and one day church he will crack that eastern sky wide open and there he will sit on that white horse with fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth coming back to once and for all set the record straight that day can i just say you want to be on his team you want to be the bride that day you don't want to be scrambling asking am i in or am i out you want to know I'm with him and he's with me. Amen. We are the bride. We are the church. And he is our groom. Amen. When you know who you are, you'll then know what to do. So we're going to worship like that means something to us. Amen. We're going to worship. Even if you want to start a train, Max said he'll, he'll jump right in. And so first, let me, let me pray. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we're so incredibly grateful for you. Thank you, Father, for the work that you're doing in this house. Thank you, Father, that we are one church in many locations, in many spaces, in many expressions, but we are all your bride. Thank you for making a way for us. Thank you for loving us, pursuing us, preparing us, making a promise to us. We pray this in Jesus' name.